to pray together for these are the words of um, Hebrews uh, chapter 4 from verse 14 through to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for this confidence we have even to draw to your throne of mercy. Lord, we thank you for such a privilege that you have given us. Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for our elders who are serving among us. We pray that you will strengthen every elder and grant them the wisdom as they, so that they may be able to run the race that you have set before them. And that, that Lord, they will be victorious in every way. Heavenly Father, we pray, may you watch over their families and grant that their children will walk even in godliness. Lord, we pray for those among us that are trusting you for provisions. Won't you, Lord, have mercy on them and be gracious to them even to provide for their needs. Those that are unwell among us, Lord, I ask that you may remember mercy and, Lord, that you may restore them to good health that again they can rejoice in your goodness. Lord, thank you for those that are trusting you for spouses and even settling in their marriages and families. Lord, I pray that you would be gracious to each one of them. Lord, I thank you and pray for those that are in the, in the verge of giving up. Please, Lord, I pray that you would hold them fast. Lord, grant that the singles will keep rejoicing in you in their singlehood. And in the days of waiting for those that, Lord, you will grant spouses, I pray that you will keep them pure at heart and even in mind. Oh, Lord, we ask that you will be gracious to our country, Kenya. Please grant our president, Dr. Ruto, and his deputy grace and strength and wisdom to govern this country with truth and justice. Ask that, Lord, you may restrain them from formulating policies that are oppressing to the citizens, but rather that they will form policies that will be favorable to them. Lord, we pray that you will grant us rains and enough rains that there will be plenty within our borders. We especially ask that you will be merciful to our brothers and sisters in the north who are ravaged by the uh, ongoing drought. Lord, we pray you will be merciful to them that they will even be able to be provided for. And thank you for the people and the organizations that are being involved in supplying one thing or the other, especially the foodstuffs. Lord, we pray that you would keep refreshing them as they do this. Lord, we keep looking to you for this and many other unspoken needs in our hearts. And we ask all these things in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. 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 I will invite uh, Monica to read. I'll be reading today's word from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verse 1 to 9. In our church Bibles, it's on page 69. Exodus 34, 1 to 9. And I will read. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words, that were on the first tablet, which he broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. 
No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountains. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. And he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head, his head toward the earth and worshipped, and he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And that's the word of God. Sifiwe. We can have uh, our Bibles if you have one open there. Our focus today will actually be on two verses of those that we have read, especially verse uh, 2, 6, 7, and 8. And if we think about who God is or who, uh, uh, how God is like. But especially is interesting because it is God himself who is introducing himself. Uh, I thought, uh, what other way to know God other than what himself uh, does by introducing himself to Moses. And so we will focus uh, uh, to see uh, what he tells Moses he is and learn a few things. But before then, I will pray, and then we will get into God's word. Lord, I pray that you would grant this day that we would hear you. Thank you especially for an opportunity to think about who you are in thinking about your attributes, which, which really are who you are really, uh, really is. Lord, we pray that you would grant and open our understanding that we may see you in the pages of these scriptures. The Lord, we help us uh, to grow in knowing you and even to have the right response before you. Lord, I pray that you would help that I will not stand on the way of your word, but Lord, you would speak, because I'm a man limited in many ways. But I ask um, that, Lord, in your own ways, you would speak to us through your word today, that your church would be edified, your church will be challenged, your church will be rebuked, your church will be built up for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My name is Bundi Patrick. Uh, it's a joy to be here again. Uh, it's uh, 17 months since we were planted. It's the last time we were here, and we rejoice in an opportunity again to come and uh, fellowship with us. Yes, I was introduced. I have a wife uh, and two girls. It is a joy to be here with us, to fellowship with us. Um, I'd love to begin by telling us a story. Have you heard about the story of the blind man and the elephant? Have you heard that story before? Well, don't mind if you have not heard. I will share with you the story. I am prepared to share with you the story. So you shouldn't be worried about the story. I said there, there were six men, blind men, that is, who had a desire to see an elephant. Oh, sorry, did I say to see? <laughs> yes, they actually had a desire to see the elephant. And they were saying, once we touch it, it will, we, we will be able to know how it exactly looks like. So the story is, it so happened that one morning that an elephant was driven down the road where they stood. When they were told that the great 
beast was before them, they asked the driver to let him stop so that they may see the elephant. Why see and they, they are blind? It's because they thought once we touch it, perhaps we will get to know how it really looks like. Of course, they could not see him with their eyes, but they thought by touching him, they could learn just what kind of an animal it was. So this is how they did. They did it in turns. They were six men, blind men. So the first one happened. He put his hand on the elephant's side. And he said, well, well, now I know how about this beast. He is exactly like a war. That's the experience of, I don't know, because the elephant, I would assume it is rough. Uh, so it, he just touched it and realized and said, ah, perhaps it looks like a war. The second man felt only of the elephant's task. And he said, my brother, you are mistaken. He is not at all like a war. He is proud and smooth and sharp. I think he is more like a spear than anything else. So to the second man, the elephant is like a spear. This is what the third man did. The third man happened to take hold of the elephant's trunk. And he said, both of you guys are wrong. Anybody who knows anything can see that, that this elephant is like a snake. Can you imagine what the third guy is also saying? He, he actually says that uh, anybody who knows anything can see uh, the confidence that he has that the animal there is actually like a snake. This is what the fourth man said. He reached out his arms and grasped one of the elephant's legs, and he said, how blind are you guys? <laughs> he said, it is very plain to me that he is round and tall like a tree. And the fifth guy was a bit taller, perhaps not like me here, and he chanced to take hold of the elephant here, and he said, the blindest man ought to know that this beast is not like any of the things that you name. He said, he is ex exactly like a huge pan. And finally, the sixth guy was very blind indeed. And it was some time before he could find the elephant at all. He was looking for it all the time. The other five guys were, were touching different areas. And finally, he managed to get hold of the elephant. At last he seized the animal's tail and he said, oh, you guys, you're so foolish. He cried, you surely have lost all your senses. This elephant is not like a war or spear or snake or tree, neither is he like pan. But any man with a, a particle of sense can see that he is exactly like a rope. Can you imagine thinking an elephant is like a rope? Six men, different experiences of the elephant. The only sad thing is none of them has the correct image of what the elephant looks like. But I said even sadder that they weren't convinced that, no, I now know what the elephant is like. It's like a rope or snake or like wall or like tree. I thought, guys, that's exactly how sometimes we feel or think about God. One as it is. And sometimes how we treat God. Some say, my experience like God, this is how he looks like. This is how God seems to be. This is how God seems to be. You know what? A correct view of God leads to a correct response of God. If we do not know who God is, then we will not respond to him correctly. A wrong view of God leads to a wrong response to God. In the same way, a high view of God leads to a high view of our Christian living. A low view of God leads to a low view of our Christian living. 
have you wondered and asked, why is it that we say Kenya is 80% Christians, yet we cannot see the Christianity we profess? It's because a wrong view of God leads to a wrong response of God. Can you tell your neighbor a wrong view of God? Leads to a wrong response to God. It is our knowledge of God that determines what we think, how we think, how we act, what we believe, how we worship, how we carry out our Christian lives, how we bring up our children, how we treat our husbands and wives, how we do our businesses, how we treat our careers. All these things, actually, they are how we respond to them is directly proportional to our view of God. How I treat, how I do my businesses is actually in response to how I view God. Who say that it is easier for us to corrupt easily? It's because that's how we view about God. We are doing a series of Genesis, and we were thinking uh, the last week about sin in, in Genesis chapter 3, and how it came to earth, and even how Eve and Anderman, their view about God. God says this, they think, no, we are smarter, or the devil is actually better, I, the in incentive is even better, and they follow the instructions of God. How we view God is how we will respond to him. How I raise up my children is in my understanding of God. Why? It's because my instruction to raise my children is my, the instructions of God. And so how I view God and his instructions is the same way I will respond to God. It's right to say our entire worldview is governed by our understanding of God. Everything. Think about your life. Think about your businesses. Think about your careers. Think about how your family, how you do your family. What influences how you do your life? In my view, our entire worldview is governed by our understanding that's why growing in the knowledge of God then becomes a big deal. Bwana asikie. Tell your neighbor knowing God then becomes a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal because it influences us, especially for all of us who are Christians. We cannot say then we are Christian we are not, when we are not governed by God. Now are we governed by God is because our knowledge directly proportional to how we respond to him. In our passage today, I hope you are still there because I will be drawing you to it today. We will be seeing some of the attributes. I must say that there is a lot, uh, so many attributes that define God. I cannot exhaust. Actually, God perhaps in every Sunday give you at, at least uh, do justice to them. Pick just one attribute of God, holiness of God, and do it perhaps one or two Sundays and pick another attribute of God. But we will be seeing the attributes that God himself has revealed uh, to Moses in this passage and how to rightly respond to him. Let me say this. At no point will we get a hold of God and conclude, now I have gotten hold of God. There is no time we will get there, not in this life. So that you don't feel like I have, I have now known all that I need to know about God. No, like we were singing, knowing God should be our desire day and night until he comes again for us. 
There's no day that we should get and feel, I have known him enough. We cannot get into that point that it's enough for us to know God. We keep growing in our knowledge to go for God. Let me draw you to those scriptures there. We will go through them and then see what we learn from that. The attributes of God really define to us who God is. They are what defines his nature and character, his person, and the perfections of God and the qualities of God. That, that's what our attributes are. If you are wondering what our attributes, it's actually who God is. If we say that God is holy, we actually mean if we equate God is equal to holiness. If we say then God is supreme, we are saying God is equitable to supreme. That is who he is. Actually, you cannot separate who God is with his name or who is uh, with his character. He is. Uh, his character is actually who God is. His character defines who God is. No wonder then uh, God takes time to introduce himself this way to Moses. It's like my name. If I call myself Patrick or Bundy, I just mean one person. That's, that's who God is. And you can't separate those qualities from God. All of them, they define God. So when you think of his holiness, it defines God. When you say he's slow to anger, he is the same God. When, and, and all of them, they are into their fullness. One has a few. There is nothing like we are saying we are growing into this, like we are growing, humanly speaking. God is in fullness all those attributes that we see in the scriptures. They are the ones that defines him, the qualities, the perfections, his person, his character, his nature. The attributes of God defines that. No. The qualities that define men, sometimes we can argue about them. Sometimes we say, that guy is kind, uh, kind of kind. <laughs> One has a few. <laughs> um, you know, that's, you, you can argue about that when you talk about the kindness of a guy because, yeah, it may change perhaps with the person who I am kind to or sometimes the circumstances Sometimes we show kindness, William Fuko Uko, to people. That's not our God. We say that guy is a good guy. Well, you can argue. Uh, what exactly do you mean when you say that guy is good? Well, the last time I interacted with him, I didn't quite like this and this and this and this. But the other person, perhaps, he liked how the guy smiles. Say, da, perhaps that guy is not bad. He's a good guy. Mothers, anaungianga sana kama mimi, ingine, spendi vile uwa nanyamaza, you know. All those things can define men. But when we say this thing about God, 100% never changes with times and seasons. It make a difference from us. Our attributes are limited. We cannot say we have anything in fullness, but everything we say about the character of God, it is in its fullness. One has a few. In our passage today, God himself reveals his character to Moses. Let me read again uh, for you those portions in 34, 6 to 7, in case you missed. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilt, visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children, and the children's children, on the third and fourth generation. Let me just give quick short background. I am teaching Exodus. I am just interested with 
um, the definitions or the characters of God. So you will forgive me because I'm not going to details of what was happening here. But perhaps I can mention. Moses has just been called by God so that he can be sent to go and deliver his, the children of Israel from Egypt. And chapter 3, God, for the first time, he reveals himself to Moses. And he says, I am who I am. I am I sent you. Perhaps I thought Moses felt eh, that's not quite enough. It's this guy who is calling himself I am. They have a lot of series of things that have happened. But in chapter 32, children of Israel have sinned before God. They have made themselves a golden calf. And in chapter 33, Moses comes and makes an intercession, pleading for God's mercy over them. They have sinned in chapter 32. Moses, as the priest before them, he makes intercession before them. Perhaps that the Lord would be merciful to them. And this is what Exodus chapter 33, verse 13 says. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. That's the prayer Moses makes to God. And I thought pastorally, I think this is a good prayer to make, brothers and sisters. It's good to pray that we may know the Lord. It's what Moses pray, prays. Please show me now your ways. Good to make such a prayer that we may know the Lord. The same prayer Paul makes in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You know, sometimes, oftentimes, we ask many things from God. And perhaps little times we ask that we may know God. It's good to be reminded it is a good prayer to make like Moses that we may know God. May the Lord grant it to our hearts that we will desire to know him. And you know what? Is after Moses makes that prayer that God responds in chapter that four. Say, say, thank you for the prayer. I will show myself to you. And what we are reading here, God is just presenting himself to Moses. He is appearing to Moses, verse six there. See what the Bible says, that the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. He shows himself up, of course, I don't think he's in person, but his, his presence was there, right there, and he proclaims who he is. That was six to seven. Begin by seeing the first portion right there. This is what God himself says. I am the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. When he says, the Lord, the Lord, I, I couldn't imagine Mungu wanaongea na Musa hivi, and he is appearing, and, and, and God even repeats his name twice. Hey, I said, I am Patrick, Patrick. He says, I am the Lord, Lord. Says, hey Moses, please don't doubt who I am. I told you I am Patrick. I am the same, same Patrick who is speaking to you today. I said I am the Lord, chapter 3. I am repeating, I am the same, same God who spoke to you sometimes back. It's emphasizing who he is before God before Moses, so that Moses may not have any doubt of who God is. He is the Lord, the Lord. And you can see in our Bibles, the Lord is in capital. So that's a significant thing. It's because our language, English, is, is limited. But he says, I am Yahweh. I am, I am God who is self-existing God. So he says, I am the Lord, the Lord. He is self-existing God. And so 
One of the attributes of God we see there is the self-existing God. The self-existing God. Remember chapter 3, verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am sent to you. I sent you. He's repeating the same word here. He says he is the Lord, the Lord. He is Yahweh. This means that God is self-existing. Doesn't need anyone to exist. He is the I am. It also defines his eternal nature, that he's self-existing, meaning he, he existed and he will exist in eternity to come. It's not God that is ending tomorrow. Not like us, the psalm that we read, we heard that our years are limited. We, our lives are like the leaf that with us. But for God, he is the I am. He will, he was, he is and he will forever be. He is self-existing. He is not the greater that he was. The greater he will become he is the greater I am. But also I thought the I am also refers to his active existence. Why is God introducing to Moses this? It's because he knew there is a way journey between him and the people, the children of Israel, and Moses himself. And so he is an active God in his existence. He is not removed from the well-being of the people of Israel. He is with them. No wonder then he introduces himself as I am. I was, I am today. I will forever be. He changes not. He is the same, same God. Have you heard people say that Yule Mungu wa Old Testament, Sio Kama Mungu wa New Testament? Bwana Sifiwe. Kama Yule Mungu wa Old Testament, Alikuwa na Asira Sana. Now, you Testament, Akai Mbaya Sana, he's lighter. Now he deals with people. It's not true, brothers and sisters. He is the I am. He changes not. The same, same God in the Old Testament is the same, same God in the New Testament. The God who hates sin in the Old Testament and punishes sinners is the same, same God who hates sin in the New, New Testament and punishes sin. It's the same God who punishes sin even today. That is his nature. He never changes. Don't you think that God changes in all means? No, the same God of the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. But a quick implication there for I thought we can trust him. We can trust him. Sometimes we are tempted to see as though God is far away from us. He is not concerned with us, our needs, our struggles, our pains. But in contrary, God is so very near us. When I was reading this, I felt comforted to know he is the same God. The God who took, promised, took the children of Israelites out of captivity, walked with them. It's the same, same God we trust today. It's the same God that we believe today. He has never changed. No wonder the psalmist in Psalms 121 verse 4, he says, Behold who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. The same God, he never slept then, he never slumbered then, even today, the same, same God who never sleeps nor slumbers is the same God that we trust. We can trust him, brothers and sisters. Sometimes I know we are fixed by circumstances and we think, God is not for me. God is for you. The same, same God who held the heart, who fought for Israelites, is the same, same God we trust today. But you see the beauty of knowing God? The challenge of not knowing God when you are confronted by such struggles, you think, God is not for me. 
But why is God revealing himself to Moses? It's so that Moses may know God is near them. Number two character we see there is God is merciful and gracious. Right there. It's right there in your scripture, verse 6 there. God is merciful and gracious. If you're using ESV, if you're using NIV, you may find compassionate um, God and gracious God. See, mercy is about being compassionate. But when he is saying, I am a merciful God, you equate God again with mercy. You equate God again with him being gracious. Again, I will, I will come to the place where people think, no, the God of Old Testament was not, we can't see any grace in the Old Testament. No, he's a gracious God. He confesses to Moses that I am gracious God. Even Moses himself, he couldn't stand before God if God was not a gracious God. It's because of his grace and mercy that even Moses himself standing before him just to get uh, the commandments again. Mercy is about being compassionate, having deep love for the lesser or the weaker. I thought in this portion, think of the love of the mother to the child. Imagine how mothers show and express their love, their compassion, their mercy to their own children. It's even not closer to how God shows compassion to us. Not even closer. But perhaps that's the closest that we can get to see. And 13 times in the Old Testament, there is a reference, again, of God being gracious. They, they, see, mercy and grace, they are two separate, but we, perhaps when we compare, we will see why they gel together. Sometimes we have heard as I have mentioned earlier, people say the God of the Old Testament was not a gracious God. Only Jesus is. It is not true. The theme of grace of God goes throughout the scriptures and find its fullness in the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ. Think about the fullness of the grace of God is revealed in the coming of Jesus. But all through God has been acting graciously to his people. Remember the psalm that we read? He's a God who never treats us like our sin deserved. Grace of God. As you can remember, grace is largely defined as the unmerited favor. They are receiving what we never deserved. In John chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. An article by a person known as John. John. On what is grace? This is what he says. He compares three things. Grace, mercy, and justice. This is what he says about justice. He says justice is about getting what you deserve. He says, mercy is about not getting what you deserve. And he says, grace, on the other hand, it is actually getting good in return for evil. One as if you were. Amazing. So justice, sometimes here in Kenya, we really shout about justice every day. Yeah. We want justice. Justice is about getting what we deserve. Mass is about not getting really what we deserve. And mass is actually not more than getting what we don't deserve to actually getting good in return for evil. I think, think a minute uh, this with me as, as we understand God being gracious. Ushawaishi kwa ukiwa on speed kwa barabara. What was the experience with the karao? 
Bwana asifiwe sana. I thought of these three options, but the two options cannot apply in Kenya. Bwana asifiwe. Let's tuongeze maombi kidogo. Well, let me give you the first scenario. First scenario is when you are caught up by police speeding. They give you a cash bill and ask you to appear in court. Is that justice? Is that justice? Ai bwana. That is justice. Yes. You deserve it. Ulikuwa na speed. Especially kama sisi watumishi tuna hey bwana mimi ni pastor. Kwa tunakimbia kwa mkutano. But ya kikugonga hiyo cash bill, you deserve it. That is justice. It's you who overspend. So you deserve this justice. But let me give option two of an officer. Well, hii pia inaweza kuwa Kenya ukipata mzuri. An officer who, then after that, you talk to them and they say, ah, kwa leo, ah, nimekurumia. It's time we see over speed. The only challenge, of course, sisi wa Kenya, hata wa Kristu, unashikango, the first thing you are thinking, uyu police anataka pesa. We don't even have an option of telling them, hey, I am sorry that I was over speed. Na zanga kutafuta ni nini umebakisha kwa mfuko, diyo mmalizane. May the Lord help us. As we understand the holiness of God, we understand we do that against God, not against even the laws of our country. But, but I was in, in the second option where he says, you just go. Sipatikane tena ukiu over speed. That's mercy. Mekurumia. It's mercy. He's, he said, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. But next time, please do not over speed. Three op third option. Sasa hii ndio kabisa. Sijui kama uneza pata Kenya. Let's see. This is where the officer writes the charge sheet. And he hands over to you. But before I could pay, if you say, by the way, I don't have to pay your 10K. Hey. <laughs> I know, I say, hey, that Jesus. <laughs> that <laughs> That's the Kenya we want. I know, I know you're thinking about the impossibility. Me too. When, when I was thinking about this, I was saying, no, it can't be. Not, not, I actually, I don't know if it is only in Kenya, but it has never been heard. And he says, uh, actually, I'll pay whatever is needed. I will even appear in court on your behalf. Uh, don't worry. I know, I know you're saying, ah, you were a canny, you were a canny. But you know that's what the grace of God means. That's being gracious. One as if you will. You see the way you are thinking about the impossibility? Do you know that's what happened to God? And that, that's how he responds to us. Him being gracious. He's saying, I will not just forgive you. No, I am paying for your punishment. Me, me. Ndiyo nili over speed, ni kashikwa, lakini polisi anasema nita kulipia hiyo bill. Sijali, it don't even have to appear before the court. I will sort that out. That's grace, brothers and sisters. And as impossible as it may seem humanly, that's who God is. God is a gracious God. He never treats us as our sin may deserve. If he would, none of us could be standing before him. And he doesn't just show us his mercy. No. And no chaya. He extends grace to us. Saying, hey guys, you sinned. You fallen short of my glory. But I will not punish you. I will punish my son on your behalf. Grace of God. Grace of God. Rejoicing the beauty of grace. We can stay there for our grace. Kabisa. Grace is, is something good, something we love, something Christians should rejoice in, knowing that that's what our God acted to us. But let me quickly rush to the third 
thing right there says that God is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Right there, at verse 6. This means that in God dwells bountiful, immovable love and faithfulness. His love for us never changes. It's immovable. That's why he says steadfast. And I was reading through, and the psalmist, every time if you read the psalm, they keep saying, his steadfast love does what? To us forever. Every time you read, you know what that means? It means that his love never changes. It's immovable. It never changes this faithfulness. I thought his love is eternal. That's, that's what he says. You can read Psalm 136. I will, will, I will not read. But, but when the psalmist is reflecting on a matter and he says, for his love, his steadfast love, endures forever. He's saying, for your love, God never changes. It is immovable. You never change how you perceive about us. Your love endures forever. And again and again in the scriptures, it's about love, God's love, God's love for us. Do you know John 3, 16, what it says? What does it say? For God did what? So loved the world. His immovable love. Romans 5, 8 again, but God shows again his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died. For us. Can you imagine sinners like you and me while you are first lost, while you are still sinners? Sometimes we think, ah, Mungu amenipenda maana ni kosawa. Remind you, no. It's because of his steadfast love that he drew us forever. He never needed you to be good for him to love you. Actually, he loved us when we were dirty, we were lost, we were helpless. That's why he says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world. I thought faithfulness alludes to his, the fidelity of God. God is not about to change his mind upon his word. He's a faithful God. Tell your neighbor we can take God at his word. Tell someone you can take God at his word. Even when we are faithless, God remains to be faithful. Steadfast love and his faithfulness are due us forever. Sorry, I have to rush through this. Finally, see what he says in verse 7 there. This is just to appetite you to continue reading about the attributes of God. There are so many attributes of God in the scriptures. Please go read through them. It helps you to know God better. Verse 7 there, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilt. Tough one there. Again, is the character of God. God is a just God. He's loving to his people, forgiving even their iniquity and trans transgressions, but who will by no means clear the guilt. And when we, we say just, God is just, we mean that he is perfectly righteous in his treatment to his creatures. He is perfectly righteous in how he treats his creatures. That's what we mean by God being just. No wonder then he says there, it's not clear in guilt, but he forgives. It's difficult to separate God's righteousness and his justice. I don't know if I mentioned that sometimes, not sometimes, it's actually always our understanding of God also helps us in how we view sin because 
If we do not understand God, then we do not understand the magnitude of sin. Sometimes we think God is unjust. Why would God, good God, punish good people? Why would a God punish good people? And, and people can argue about how good they are and how God is unjust. But understanding who God is helps us even to appreciate no, none of us who is good. He's just his mercy and his grace. So God is perfectly righteous in how he treats his creatures. So it's, so it's difficult to separate God's righteousness and his justice. No, they go together. The same way we say that um, his mercy, his grace, uh, they go together. So these two are separable. His love and his mercy go together. Without his justice, then we cannot think well about sin. I wonder, Psalmist in Psalm 89 14, he writes, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Righteousness and justice, your steadfast love and your faithfulness go before you. Righteousness and justice. Understanding God's justice is very key in appreciating Jesus coming for us. Unless we appreciate that God is a just God, he says he will punish sin, he will exactly do that. If we do not appreciate that, then we don't even appreciate why Jesus had to come to rescue us from our sin. Remember what we said about justice? Justice is getting what we deserve. Do you remember the story of the policeman who said, please, you don't mind about the cash bill, I will sort it. That's exactly what God did for us. God has provided a way to satisfy his justice. It's the man, Jesus Christ. So either you, Jesus takes the punishment for your sin or you take it to yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, this is what the Bible says. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Him, Jesus, to be sin, so that us, the creatures, become the righteousness of God. Just God, justice, punishing evil, but there is a man, Jesus, there, and we will be concluding by seeing that. I didn't want to labor so much in that. Look at verse 8 as we finish. What did Moses do? Can we read verse 8 together? Can we do that again? Amen. As soon as Moses hears who God is, what does he do? He bows down and worships the Lord. The right response to our knowledge of God is not to boast about how much we know God. May the Lord help us sometimes. The more we know his word, the more we grow in our boasting. The more you know about God should lead us to more worship of God. Moses hears who God is. The first thing he does, bows down and worships God. But even the contrary is true. Did you see why you can't worship God without knowing him? You realize how it is hard to have the right worship for God without knowing him. Have you wondered why Christians, the way we respond to God, how we treat God, we treat him with the knowledge we have for him. If we think that God hates sin, we will respond in knowing, yes, truly, I can't sin because God hates it. Do 
Do you see why people respond to God differently, brothers and sisters? It's because of their knowledge of God. But the right way to respond to God is through our worship for him. But we have also said you cannot have better worship for God without having a better understanding for God. Actually, our understanding for God is the foundation of true worship. Think about idolatry. It's because people have a low understanding of who God is. Do you see why you treat God the way you treat him? Do you see why you treat your business the way you treat it? Do you see why you treat your wife the way you treat him? You treat her or your husband the way you treat him? It's because of how you view God and his decrees. So we draw to conclusion. Are you there? You do not know God. You have not had a relationship with this God who introduces himself to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Did you see why we are emphasizing why we ought to know God? Because yes, coming to church is good, is not good enough. The only way to know how to respond to God is by having our knowledge of him clear. Did you know why he introduced himself to Moses? Is because he wanted to relate to Moses. Bonus if you will. He didn't want to be a mystery God. He wanted to relate to Moses. No wonder then he says, this is who I am. When I tell you I am Patrick, I want to begin something relationship with you. He wants, wanted to relate to Moses. Brothers and sisters, if you do not know, if not come to the knowledge of Jesus, Jesus would still today love to relate with you. He would love that you would know him. But it begins by you saying, yes, Lord, I would love you be the master of my life. Will you trust Jesus today? Will you trust him? Will you rely on him, this compassionate God? Did you see how he has not acted like all of us deserved? None of us could be here existing. He has acted to us graciously. But number two, for those of us who know the Lord, how have you responded to God? I felt rebuked because sometimes we act as though we know the Lord, but we do not respond correctly to him. We do not respond correctly to his instructions. Sometimes we do not see the seriousness of when he says, I am God, please do one, two, three, four, five things. When he instructs us, husband and wife, to love and to submit, have we responded correctly? to the Lord who reveals himself. If not, may the Lord help us, you and me, turn to him and seek for his mercy. The Lord who has revealed himself to us. Finally, I pray that we will keep praying that we will be growing in his knowledge, becoming more like him. May this prayer, like Paul, may not depart our mouth, that we may know God. One as if you will. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you that in your word you have revealed yourself and that in it we can get to know you. And we thank you this morning that we have been able to uh, reflect on a few attributes of God, especially a new being, loving and compassionate, a new being gracious, a new being self-existent. Lord, we repent for the days that we have not had quite the right response to you. Sometimes, Lord, like Moses would say in verse 9, we are stiff neck and people. Please have mercy on us. Sometimes, Lord, we have not 
boast, we have not worshipped you in our knowledge. We have boasted that we know you. Lord, have mercy on us, and you grant that each one of us would know you, would have a longing to know you and to live for you. Please help us that, Lord, we will respond correctly in how we do our families, in how we do our careers, in how we do our lives, in how we do church, in how we worship, Lord. Help us that in these ways, Lord, it will be a reflection of the God who you are and who we have known. Please help us to hate sin and run away from it, but instead to run to you. May you help us like Paul would pray and Moses that we may know you. Lord, may you help us that this prayer will not depart from our mouth. Every day our desire will be that we may know you, Lord, that we may know you, that we may know you, that we may know you. That's our desire and our prayer now and even in the days to come. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.